cutting cutting the church off from the ordinary means of grace. Uh, you, you said like stifling um, there's there's spiritual growth, stagnating um, this lack of spiritual nourishment. Uh, it just it just made me think, and I know that you've preached on this text as well, so I'll be interested to hear your thoughts. But it made me think of Hebrews ten, you know, um, of course, verse twenty five, but backing up to verse twenty four. But then I want to cross reference that with a, a text in Hebrews three that I think the two go hand in hand. So. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, it says, and let us consider, right? These are the one another's that you were talking about. Because verse 25 says, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. But verse 24, if you back up just a little bit, it says, let us consider how to stir up one another or exhort one another. It's the same kind of phrase, exhort or stir one another up to love and good works, comma, it's not even a period. It's, he's not even taking a breath. The very next statement in the same, in the same breath, um, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as the day draws near. And so basically, if you look at Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, uh, it seems as though the apostle is saying, we need to be adamantly thinking and considering how we can exhort one another, um, spur one another on, stir one another up, these one another's that, that um, propel us, uh, that bolster our faith, um, that, that feed and nourish us spiritually and supernaturally. We need to be thinking about that all the time. Um, and then the very next statement, I mean, it's the same statement, but the next phrase of the statement is not neglecting the gathering. And so I look at that in exegeting Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, and I look at that as, as the implicit point of that is that the chief context, not the only, but the chief context um, where, where believers most naturally stir one another up to love and good works is the gathering. So, so I think that's what the apostle is getting at is we need to be considering how we can further bolster one another's faith by stirring each other up to love and good works. And the very next thing out of his mouth is not neglecting to gather because the gathering is, I think the implicit point is the gathering is the chief context in which we stir one another up. And then if you take that and cross-reference it over to Hebrews 3 verse 12 and 13, it says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Right? So he's talking about apostasy, the danger of apostasy. You and I both know that if they, you know, First John uh, chapter 2, they went out from us because they were never one of us. And so we wouldn't say that this is somebody losing their salvation, but we would say that there is a very real possibility that someone who claims to be a brother, who bears the name of Christ, um, who professes Christ, doesn't actually possess Christ. Christ. And so there can be people who are part of the visible church. They could be members on our roster, and we need to take extra care lest there be any of us, even, even ministers who would say on that final day, Lord, Lord, um, you know, that have an evil, unbelieving heart that would eventually lead us to fall away from the living God. And so by contrast, how do we take care? What should we do? Uh, verse 13, very next verse, but exhort one another. It's the same phrase as stir one another up, Hebrews 10, 24. Now it's Hebrews 3, 13. Be careful because you can have an unbelieving heart that would lead you to apostasy, to lead you to, to fall away from the living God. So instead of that, verse 13, exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So my point is what I would argue in that in terms of ecclesiology, and I, I know you'll agree with this, Pastor James, is that the gathering, it's kind of like a logical three-step process. So first step, the gathering is the chief context for stirring one another up. Yes. And I believe that's the Lord's Day gathering. Number two, we need to be always considering how to stir one another up because it's one of the chief defenses that the Lord has given to us to guard against apostasy. Yes. So if you take that just logically and you think about this, we basically have the physical threat that comes by gathering of the virus but we have the spiritual threat to the soul, the very soul of man that comes by not gathering. And so at the end of the day, now we're not Gnostics, we both, both matter, but, but if we had to say what's more important, the soul of a man or his body, we would have to say the soul. And so really what we're trying to weigh here is how serious is the threat of the virus to the body and how serious is the threat of not gathering and stirring one another up to love and good works um, how, how, how big, because that's one of our chief defenses, our barrier, our shield to apostasy. How serious is the spiritual threat that comes by not gathering? And so what I would say, I would look at that, and I told you this before we recorded, I would say there actually are some circumstances where if, you know, if I live in a coastal town and the mayor gives me a call and says, 
there is a tsunami of biblical proportions coming, and it's a Saturday night. It's coming Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Um, you need to get all. You need to cancel church and get all your people out there because because the death rate is going to be 100. percent Then yeah, we're going to cancel church and we're going to use that Sunday morning to get get everybody out of Dodge. But here's the deal: in that scenario, uh, number one, everything would be canceled. Dispensaries, we dispensaries, and Black <laughs> Lives Matters movements, and everything would be canceled. But but number two, we would be missing one week of church. Now, granted, our building would be you know, but we could we could, the very next Sunday, Lord willing, we could meet in the field. Or whatever we have to do. And so we're missing one week of church, which, you know, over here, the spiritual threat, we're neglecting the gathering. There's a spiritual threat of apostasy, but we're, we're neglecting one week. So the spiritual threat is low, I guess is my argument. But over here, tsunami, the perceived physical threat to the body is very, very high. So with a, this immense physical threat to the body and a relatively low spiritual threat to the soul, because we're only talking about missing one week, it's an easy decision. But, but when all of a sudden the data keeps coming in, and it's not just weeks anymore, 15 days to slow the spread, but it's, it's a year has gone by, and more months are going by, and you're talking about neglecting not, not just one Lord's Day gathering, but you're talking about neglecting 50, 60, 70, soon to be 100. Lord, the spiritual threat is growing for apostasy, and your role as a shepherd is, I mean, you've got to be feeling as a shepherd of God's flock the, the, a, a, a righteous anxiety building in your in your soul. Like, I've got to shepherd the flock of God and the chief context. Yes, I can give them a phone call and yes, they can live stream, but the chief context for stirring one another up and exhorting one another so that we don't have a believing heart that leads us to fall away from the living God is the gathering. And that's what Hebrews says. And so the spiritual threat is growing as time keeps going on. And as time is going on, we keep getting more and more data saying that the virus isn't nearly as threatening as we originally thought it was. So the, the perceived physical threat to the body keeps going down. And the more Sundays we miss, the, the, the very real tangible spiritual threat to the soul is going up. I, and I, it, it seems pretty simple. And yet pastors and Christians all over the world don't get it. I, I don't... Well, and here's, here's, Would you... current, dude. yeah, just think about this. So everything you're saying is, is excellent. I'm, I'm tracking with you. And here's part of the challenge. A lot of Christians aren't in churches that are functioning the way they ought to function. A lot of folks right. show up for church on Sunday, hear kind of a watered down sermon, sing a couple of hymns and, uh, and then go home. You know, it, they might get asked, Hey, how you doing? Fine. You know, they might get asked, did you see the game last night? Talk about that a little bit. But there's not any real meaningful fellowship going on. So so functionally, Sunday morning is a spectator sport. They just come, they take, mm -hmm. and they leave. Well, in a real biblical context with a real vibrant, healthy body where, where you're going to be asked, how are you doing? And it's not just like, I'm doing fine. It's like, no, how are you doing? And I want to get involved in your life to the point that if you're not willing to have that kind of involvement, you end up leaving because you just don't like people asking you how you're doing with that level of intentionality. It's a, it's a completely different body life. And so when people come to Grace Life Church, for example, even from churches in our area that are complying and they see what's going on, I mean, they're just like, it's a breath of fresh air. People come into our gathering and, and they, they've, they forgot what they were missing. They, we've got mm -hmm. folks who come in and they're in tears from the, the first song until the closing prayer because they just mm -hmm. forgot about how much they needed to be with the body of Christ. So mm -hmm. whether it's they've forgotten what they once enjoyed in their church or they've never actually enjoyed real, healthy, mm -hmm. vibrant fellowship, that, that contributes to this entire, this entire issue. You're right. Some people, you can't miss what you've never had. You can't, that's what you're saying. So that's a great point. I didn't even think about You're saying that maybe some of, of the opposing argument is coming from professing Christians and maybe they really are Christians, but who have been a part of a church that, that that's maybe not as faithful in its preaching, that's more of a spectator sport, that's not stirring one another up to love and good works, that's not rightly administering the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism. And so for them, it's just like, James, what's the big deal? Yeah. Right. So like I, me, me and my friends are getting the same thing live stream. And, and you're exactly. saying if a church really, for lack of a better phrase, if a church really sucks, then yeah, your live spring living, a uh, live stream living room experience might be comparable, but that's not the kind of church that we're talking about. Is, is that, is exactly. that what you would say? Exactly. Yeah. They, they can live stream because they're, they're functionally live streaming anyway. 
That's profound. Functionally live streaming already. Thanks for watching this video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, uh, we hope that you'll take a moment and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can watch more content like this. Also, take a moment and give this video a like so that it can reach more people. And take a moment and click on the bell so that you'll be notified whenever we come out with new content. Thanks so much. God bless.